Taryn Thompson is a C sessional instructor at the Faculty of Education at the University of Windsor. She is a retired, in quotes, teacher with special lists in both drama in education and special education. In her 30 plus career in education, she has held the titles of arts department head, as well as special education program leader for the Greater Essex County, Dis County District School Board. She has facilitated workshops for the Ontario Secondary School Teacher Federation, International Drama Educators Association, and several universities. She has been an invited speaker and presenter at several Canadian Organization of Rare Disorders national conferences, the International World Word Fest 2022, as well as the Moracle Foundation in England. Karen is the author of the children's book, Different is Just, dot, 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 different, as well as Purple Stew, a parenting guide. She is with us today to help transform the effects of anger and anxiety that many people experience in today's society. Please welcome Karen Tompkins. Thank you. All right. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers, PJ, uh, for having me here today. And I'm honored to be able to share my experiences with you and thankful for the time that we are given to reflect on um, best practices. And ah, just kidding. <laughs> It's not going to be like that at all. Now, the, the reason that I have that kind of opening is because just in those few seconds of my talking, perhaps in a way that you didn't expect at this type of event, um, some of you may have had a flight response and you were ready to just run outside into the beautiful weather that Maria was talking about earlier, or you may have had a uh, fight response. And you were just going to throw your computer across the room. <laughs> and you may have had a fright response, you know, where you just freeze and like, how do I get out of this? And so we're going to take a few minutes today to talk about why our neurochemistry, why our brains and bodies um, get us into that situation with just a few seconds of a problem that we're not sure how to resolve and our neurochemistry kicks in and we have a fright, flight, or freeze mode. Okay, so I, I think PJ told you most about who I am. So we're just going to go flip right to here. This is my daughter, Erin, and she will be 30 in the summer. And she was born with a rare disorder called Joubert syndrome. So we know of about 2000 people in the world who have Joubert syndrome. And she is the reason that I started learning all things about the brain and behavior and things like that, uh, because she's actually missing a piece of her brain. Uh, but we didn't know that when she was born. She was closer to five before we had a diagnosis for her. And that's her with her younger sister, Sarah. Um, Sarah has a degree in neuro science and biology, which means she and I talk about brain stuff all the time and we challenge each other for different research and things like that. And this is Erin just a few years ago. Um, so she now lives at a group home, which is wonderful because I am still living and kicking and that is rare for a person to have a spot in a group home in Ontario when parents are still able to care for their child. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's the same globally at this point in time. So Sarah talks about it's okay to feel badly when bad things are happening to you. In fact, we are wired that way. And I would say that if bad things are happening and you're not feeling badly, then maybe that could be a problem. <laughs> um, but I also add that we need to get our brain juice back to an optimum level in order to move on from what it is that's keeping us in this loop of anger and anxiety. There's lots of things that um, get us into a fright flight fight mode, uh, maybe at work, uh, things get rescheduled, and now you have to rethink what you're going to do tomorrow. 
And there's worry, stress, and anxiety. And all of these three things have their own definition that I'd like to go through right now and just kind of clarify since um, for our time here, I want to be able to discern between worry, stress, and anxiety. So worry is a feeling. I feel worried. I feel hungry. I feel tired. And you take care of that feeling and it goes away. Whereas stress are thoughts. I was very stressed just before this started. Um, is anybody going to come to the party? Is, am I going to say silly things? Uh, is my internet going to work? Those kinds of things. And, you know, your thoughts just start spinning, but they're thoughts. And once um, the, the problem is resolved, then your stress goes away. It's like, oh, yeah, okay, that all worked out. That's great. Let's move on. But anxiety is your body's physical response to stress. Okay, so that's more than and different from worry and stress. Anxiety is your body's physical response to stress. Uh, oh, sorry, let's talk about mindfulness for a bit. There's all kinds of things that we can do to help with our feelings and thoughts. Uh, deep breathing. Um, what are some other things that some people here um, have done, Steph Stefana or Maria? What kinds of things do you do to keep your feelings and thoughts from being worried and stressful? Go for a long walk. Meditate. Yes, walk. Meditate. Absolutely. PJ, got anything? Um, well, like I mentioned before, the Tai Chi, I do that. Mm -hmm. That's and some people say refer to Tai Chi as a form of standing meditation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because you, you focus your brain on the set what the, that you're doing and, mm -hmm. yep. out and some, right. And some people do um Med meditation, prayer, laughing. Laughing yoga is supposed to be really wonderful for uh, relieving stress as well. Being just outside is a really good one too. But anxiety needs more than just thinking. You didn't think your way into anxiety, so you can't think your way out of it because it's actually a physical response. And anxiety shows itself in a lot of different ways. Um, I'm going to let you take a look at this slide for a minute. Some of these things I was doing before I learned about the neurochemistry of behavior, and I kind of thought it was a personality flaw, because some of these things are like a type A personality. And then I realized, actually, they're a product of my anxiety. Things like wanting to control people and events, high expectations. I just want to point out that feeling agitated or angry is actually one way that anxiety presents itself. It's not the opposite side of the coin. It's actually part of the same side. I don't know if you've seen Shrek. When they talk about ogres are like onions because there are different layers. So when I started in my journey in neurochemistry, I was told by my teacher that a person is like a rose within an onion. You can see this wonderful, sweet person in the center, but life gives us layers that sort of cloud that person and stop us from being the best person we can be. So some of those layers uh, can be addressed with those mindfulness techniques um, that we just talked about. Some of them can be addressed with social theories like behaviorism. I'm going to train myself not to open the fridge to get cookies when I'm stressed because I know that's wrong for me. And so if I have a really 
difficult noise, something that's going to be really loud every time I open the door where the cookies are, then I won't open the door anymore because I will learn. I will be trained to not open that cupboard because it's going to make a bad sound that I don't like. So that kind of behaviorism, you know, also known as uh, the bell rings and the dog starts salivating because it's been trained that when the bell rings, it's going to get fed. So there's behaviorism. There's a uh, cognitive theory where if I understand why I'm doing these things, I can talk myself into doing it differently or to just not go there in the first place. So. I'd like to tell you a story about Erin. Uh, as I said before, Erin's missing a piece of her brain. And when she was about three years old, I would put her and her little sister into the car and we would go out on a drive for about an hour to go see my dad. And every time Erin got into the car, within a few minutes, she would start feeling very agitated. And I knew that this was going to happen. And then she would always ask for chocolate milk. So being a good mom, I had like this little sippy cup of chocolate milk all ready because I knew she was going to ask for it. And so we'd go and sure enough, I could see her getting agitated and I would hand and she would say chocolate milk and I would hand it back to her and she'd take a sip and she'd say, oh, and she'd hand it back to me. And a couple of minutes would go by and then she'd say chocolate milk. I want chocolate milk. And so I would hand it to her and she'd say, oh, and then she would hand it back to me. And this would keep escalating until we got to a point where she was throwing the chocolate milk into the back, into the front seat. I was very upset saying, well, I'm not giving it to you because not what you wanted anyway. And Sarah was upset because mommy was upset. And by the time I got to my dad's house, I was the one who needed the time out. And it was very, very difficult because it didn't matter what kind of behavioral or cognitive therapies we were trying, Erin would still go into this cycle of anger. Another example of this before I get into how did we break that cycle and how can you break that cycle in yourself? And what does it look like for us who have more neurotypical brains? So at the end of Erin's day, we would have a family supper and she would get very, very angry and agitated and she would start hitting the table and she would be like baby swearing and pushing things away and so my husband and I you know being good parents we would pick her up and we'd bring her to another room and we would say no hitting is not acceptable at our table come back when you're ready to do um to sit with us nicely and so she would come back after a few minutes and she'd be standing there, tears streaming down her face, and she'd be hitting the wall beside her and saying, I know hit, I'm sorry, I know hit, but yet she was. So cognitively, behaviorally, she understood that her behavior was not something that should be happening right now. But she obviously was not actually con in control of what her body was doing. And so that's when I learned about the neurochemistry of behavior. To find out why is it that we know what we should or do, but sometimes we just get into this little loop that we can't get out of in order to do the right thing. So I'm going to skip a few slides because I really want to get um, to our discussion. And so very quickly, the front part of your brain is your thinking brain. And that's where all the information is processed. Whereas the back part of your brain, the hind brain, that's like your lizard brain. Those are your reactions, your innate reflexes, things like breathing, your heartbeat, all those kinds of things. But it's also where we regulate our emotions, where we work on motor control, things like that. And that's actually the part that my daughter Erin is missing in her brain. 
And if you can look at that MRI, that little black and white picture and grays, that's my daughter's brain. So where it's black in the center around what looks like a white molar tooth, that's where she's missing the brain matter. And that's the area in the cerebellum that is going to gate all the information in and out. So if I'm on the phone talking to a friend and I'm cooking and I hit the stove with my finger, the, what's going to happen is my external senses, I'm going to see it, I'm going to feel it, I'm going to maybe smell it or hear it, that my finger is burning. And that information will travel up into my brain, it gets gated through my frontal cortex says, hmm, I've heard of this stuff before. What is this? Oh, yes, we're burning. We should move. I'm just going to send a message down to my arm to move my finger out of the way. And we know that that happens in like a second, right? But for Erin, because she's missing that part of her brain, it happens in a very much slower time frame. So she touches it, Ow! Because it takes her that much longer to get all of the information into the place where it can think about it and then out to the body to do something about it, which, you know, would be pretty stressful for her. Then we have the emotional part of our brain. And there's this thing called the HPA access. So our bodies are like savory soup, okay? So one time I was on vacation with my husband and I ordered squash soup, which I don't usually do because I don't really like squash, but this soup was amazing. So I asked the, the, the people there, um, you know, how, how do you make it? What's, what's in this? And they told me the ingredients, but I didn't ask for the recipe. And so there were several times that I tried to recreate this soup, but I didn't know how much squash and how much of this uh, chicken soup broth and how many onions. And I didn't know I was guessing. And our bodies are like that. Through our emotional brain, one of the things that happens is the hypothalamus sends a message down into our adrenal glands, which are on top of our kidneys. And that releases cortisol into our system. And cortisol is one of the many ingredients of our body. When the cortisol is released, there are different things in our bodies that go into effect so that we can quickly resolve whatever the problem is, getting out of the way of a truck, things like that. And when that information hits the brain, it goes through these different, your nerve cells, which aren't actually touching each other. And so we need neurotransmitters to move those pieces of information from cell to cell. So I want to talk about three specific neurotransmitters, dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. So let me just put in this into perspective. We know that there are all kinds of mindfulness activities that can help our thoughts and our, and our stressful our, our worry, our stress, those kinds of things, our thoughts and our feelings. We can also do social work kinds of things where, you know, behavioral cognitive types of therapies. We can also adjust the neurochemicals in our body. And I'm just going to talk about three tiny little neurotransmitters that are microscopic all of these things that we've talked about in the last 14 minutes are viable. They are all excellent ways of dealing with anger and anxiety. But if you're hitting a wall and you feel like you've tried everything and nothing's working for you, 
then perhaps the layer of the onion that you need to work on is your neurochemistry layer. So let, let me give you an example of how this works. You're sitting at your computer and somebody says, boo, and you have a fright response, a flight response, or a fight response. And you do that without even thinking because you're not thinking. It's like if you almost get hit by a truck, the truck comes at you and you have a freeze fright response during the headlights, a flight response, you run out of the way, or you have, and you've seen this happening, a fight response, and you're going to beat up the car that almost hit you, which doesn't make any sense. And that's because when our hind brains react to the cortisol in our systems, our hind brains are doing all the work and we are not connecting to the thinking part of our brain. And those chemicals, the dopamine and the norepinephrine, cause you to focus on what is the problem? Why is there a problem? So for Erin, she, she was feeling agitated. And her three-year-old brain would say, well, I should get some chocolate milk because chocolate milk makes me feel better. And I would give her the chocolate milk and she'd take a sip and would be like, no, nope, that didn't make me feel better. And she'd hand it back to me. And then she would feel agitated again. And her three-year-old brain would say, okay, we still have to solve this problem. Chocolate milk, chocolate milk makes me feel better. And I'd hand her the chocolate milk, but that wasn't going to cut it. And she couldn't move on from the effects of this anger and anxiety with, this, with her hindbrain trying to resolve this problem without using your prefrontal, your thinking brain. I'm going to skip through parts of this. So what, whoops, sorry, that's not the one I wanted to go to. So what happens when you get out of the way of the truck? If you've ever almost gotten hit by a car, right? You, you get to safety and you can feel serotonin rushing into your system. And its job is kind of like the cop saying, nothing to see here. Everything's all fine. All problems are solved. You know, everybody go take five. And so you start to be aware of your surroundings. You feel your heartbeat slowing down. You feel you, your breath rate going back to normal. And that's because the problem has been resolved. So the dopamine and norepinephrine that has been trying to keep you hyper focused on solving that problem has been successful. And so the serotonin recognizes that, shows up and says, okay, let's go back to thinking again. So dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. But a couple hours later, you go to tell somebody about that truck that almost hit you. And you can feel your body responding the same way it did in the real situation. Just the memory of a stressful event can put us into that cortisol fight, fright, flight response. And David Rock talks about how some of the things that we experience as humans, especially at work in our daily lives, can actually put us into that cortisol response as effectively as a truck almost hitting us. So do you feel like you have status? Are you able to predict outcomes? Do you feel like you have control over what's happening to you? Do things seem related? Does life seem fair? All those kinds of things will make your neurochemistry respond like you're getting hit by a truck. It's okay to feel badly when bad things are happening. We're wired that way. And we need to get our brain juice, our neurochemistry back to an optimum level so that we can move on. So what do I do about it? Well, it's not your fault, first of all. 
If you have anger and anxiety, you have that gray feeling, you snap at people, you're, you just, it's just not going well for you. It is not your fault. All of our bodies have their own recipe for the ingredients that are there. It's kind of like somebody who has diabetes. Their bodies don't process the sugars effectively. They need insulin to actually inject insulin in order to be able to be an, at an optimum level to not go into a diabetic coma. And anxiety and depression and anger, same thing. Your body is not producing enough serotonin for the amount of difficult problems that you are trying to resolve in your life. And if those problems are things like, well, her brain is missing a piece of it, or you have a boss that, well, just doesn't make sense, not very, not very happy boss, or the end of a relationship, or a global pandemic, or politicians that don't make sense and make you angry. So when it's not your problem to resolve, the serotonin doesn't show up because the problem hasn't been resolved. So I'm going to very briefly go through some ways to naturally increase serotonin, and then we can go move on to our discussion. So studies have shown that things like your favorite music or the color green or sunlight, those things can add little, it's like putting little drops of serotonin into your brain. Well, it's not really drops of serotonin, that's an analogy, but you, you can imagine that you get a little bit more of a serotonin burst. <clears throat> Another one is actually my thing, uh, sugary carbs actually do increase serotonin in your brain. And so the fact that when I'm having a stressful day, I want to go find a box of cookies, uh, that's because my brain knows it needs more serotonin, despite the fact that my doctor doesn't think I should use the cookies to increase it. Uh, tactile sense, that's you know getting a nice deep massage or a bath or you wrap up in a blanket. That's like a shot glass of serotonin. Joint compressions, okay, so when the joints are banging into each other and you're putting a picture of yourself in your brain, that's proprioception, that's an internal sense, like running or lifting weights, that gives you like a water glass full of serotonin and that will last you for about an hour. But the biggest bang for your buck is the stibular, where your head is in space. So swinging on a swing, jumping on a trampoline, going on a roller coaster, being on a boat. I don't know if you know people who have a boat, but they'll, they'll say, you know, 10 minutes out on the sea and I don't have a care in the world. And it's not because of the beer. It's because that gentle rocking is exponentially increasing your serotonin. And when the serotonin shows up, the dopamine and norepinephrine say, wait, Wait, serotonin's here. Did, did, do you remember solving that problem? No, me either, but serotonin's here, so let's go take a break. The serotonin doesn't actually resolve the problem because, again, it's a problem that's not yours to resolve. But it gives your brain and body a break from reacting to that problem. And it allows you to access the thinking part of your brain to hopefully use a different kind of therapy to help you deal with the problem that you're facing. If you go on my website, there uh, is a downloadable paper that I've written that has the research on it and the different resources that I've used. Um, I had some life truths, you know, it's okay not to be okay all the time, things like that. But really my main, 
my main message is to play. If you want to increase serotonin naturally, swing on a swing, go on a roller coaster, jump up and down. So for my daughter, Erin, back to that whole chocolate milk scenario, once we learned about this, then I would see that she was getting agitated and I would pull the car over and I would do some joint compressions and I'd give her a big, deep hug and we'd rock a little bit and we'd do some deep breathing as well. And it would increase her serotonin and we could go for another half hour or so. And then she'd get agitated again and we'd pull over and then I would give her a burst of serotonin so that her norepinephrine didn't keep trying to solve the problem that it wasn't its problem to resolve because chocolate milk was not going to deal with it right we were in a car and so if i gave her the extra serotonin then it gave her the relief she needed to be able to process her environment more effectively i'd really like you to throw your mics back on and maybe either ask me some questions or talk about what what goal you might have you know where could you see yourself inserting either for your own life or somebody else's life or somebody at work or your the person that you live with um what kinds of ways could you be naturally increasing your serotonin well i already do with exercise mm -hmm. but there's other things that still, like, I can't exercise all the time and right. sometimes I don't feel like it. Right. So one of the things I did, which I'll share with you is, you know, it's like my brain doesn't talk to each other. My mommy brain and my teaching brain that knows all of this stuff about neurochemistry doesn't talk to my me brain <laughs> that deals with my own problems and so finally, after 20 years of doing this uh, research and giving workshops, uh, either speeches to people or workshops with people, I bought myself a hammock swing and put it in my basement so that it didn't matter what time of day or what kind of weather it was. If I was feeling that agitation, like I'm just going to splinter or I'm getting stuck going through the same thoughts all the time. I go downstairs, I flip on some really nice music and I swing for about 10 or 15 minutes. And the serotonin increases. My problems don't go away, but my body stops responding to it. Because as we said in the beginning, anxiety is your body's physical response to unresolved stress. So yes, you're right. I can't exercise that much either. So thinking about other ways to get your head moving without having to be at the gym is, is a wonderful way because I don't think all of us can have boats, even though that's the best one. Stefana, did you have, have any questions or anything you'd like me to clarify? No, this has been fantastic. I've taken some notes and really wonderful strategies. And it reminded me, as you were saying with the swing, I remember I would, and I still do it today when I'm feeling nervous, I will rock back and forth. And when I had my first baby, I would literally, I mean, I spent so much time and like when I'm standing there watching my son and he's 17, now I'll rock mm -hmm. to calm that part of me that definitely comes up of whatever that anxiety that, you know, that I love how you said that your body's response to unresolved stress. Absolutely. And if you yeah. think about it, we have the same brains that we did when we were infants. And when we were upset as an infant, we were swaddled and cuddled and swayed and hummed, maybe jumped, you know, bounced a little bit. And we felt better. We still have that same brain. So those are the things that we want to do to increase our serotonin. And for me, because I, well, I just have a full plate and I have lots of stuff that I deal with. And I, I've struggled with not having enough serotonin since I was 12. I remember at 12 being very angry about things. 
And so I also talked to my psychiatrist and I'm on a couple of different medications to regulate that dopamine and the serotonin, but sometimes that's still not enough. And I have to use a swing or, you know, some of those other things that we talked about. I guess I just really want to create a world where needing serotonin is as mainstream as needing insulin. Because so many people, you know, if you say that you're on mood meds or you're dealing with anxiety, suddenly you're like, oh, go away. You're weird and crazy. And we're not. (laughs) We're just trying to figure out the recipe to the ingredients in our bodies that are going to work best for us. Because life gives us stuff that we have to deal with and it changes us. And sometimes we can tweak those things to get back to a more optimum level. I think about the increase in violence and aggression in schools by students, not, not talking about the gun stuff, because they've experienced this very prolonged period because of a global pandemic which they don't understand, it's not theirs to resolve, and boy, was it scary. And so without even knowing it, we have this deep-seated anger and anxiety going on, bubbling underneath because our brains are still responding to the cortisol in our bodies, and our blood pressure is going up, and our breathing is is difficult. And we have problems concentrating. And we have dopamine and serotonin trying to find the chocolate milk that's going to make this all better. And so some people just arbitrarily pick a thing or a person that that must be the problem. That must be how I can solve this problem like Aaron in the chocolate milk. Um, I know in Canada, part of that uh, was about wearing masks during the pandemic. And whether you think you should wear a mask or not wear a mask, it really doesn't matter. The point is your brain decided that wearing a mask or not wearing a mask was going to resolve the problem completely. And we got fixated on that. And it feels good to be with a group of people who are angry about the same thing when you're feeling already, already feeling angry. I just want to buy everybody a swing or a boat. (laughs) Actually, I'm working on my master's right now in education. And um, what I'm, the research I'm doing is my end game is hoping to have a document that we can bring to principals of schools to get them to have swings available to students who are feeling like they're on the edge and training them in why they should be using.